So I want you all to imagine something for me. I want you to imagine that this is what your hometown looks like. I want you to imagine that this is what your local hospital looks like. I want you to picture that most people from your country are currently displaced from their homes and are in refuge in places like this. Because anything is better than having to risk this. Today I want to talk to you all about my um, intentions for a policy in the United States to pressure our government to do more and to make a more conscientious effort to support Syrian refugees. I'm going to break down my speech into three main factors. Firstly, how the Syrian war started and the severity of it today. Secondly, um, why now is a time more than ever that we really need to focus on pushing these, um, our government to encourage uh, Syrian refugees into the country. And finally, how Trump's ban has had a very negative impact and has set back the situation. So for those of you who don't know how the Syrian war started, it all began with the Arab Spring. Now, the Arab Spring is a term that refers to the time in which the Tunisian and Egyptian people were revolting against their presidents um, in order to gain more rights and civil liberties. Now, the Syrian people began to peacefully protest um, in order to support the Arab Spring. Um, these protests were very much peaceful until about 15 young boys uh, started graffitiing walls to uh, show support of the Arab Spring. Now, these boys were then detained and tortured, and one of them, who was nearly 13 years old, was killed after being tortured for several weeks. Mm. Now, these protests began to become a lot less peaceful, and that led the president of Assad, <coughs> who was um, quite an oppressive leader, who he still is the president today, um, he began killing the demonstrators in the streets and um, detaining thousands more. From this, in July 2011, we see um, rebels of the army beginning to start the Free Syrian Army. Um, this was an army that would support the rebels um, and they would fight against the government. Um, as you can see behind me, this is actually the Syrian government bombing the homes of Syrian people. So you can imagine how unsafe it is when even in your own country, you're under threat by your own government. So 5,000 years later, um, and these statistics are coming from UNICEF, I mean, not 5,000 years, five years later, um, this is the situation we have now. We have 450,000 civilians killed. We have 700,000 trapped in besieged areas. We have over a million people injured. Another 12 million people are displaced from their homes. 13.5 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. 1.75 million children are no longer able to attend school and 2.5 cho uh, million children are living on the run or as refugees. And that's half of the Syrian population, which is currently on the run. So 4.9 million people in Syria yes. are currently on the run. So what is our country doing about this? Well, as we see in this article from the, um, from the Washington Times, we know that um, Obama's administration decided in August 2016 that they were going to try to get 10,000 more refugees into the country by the end of the fiscal year in September 1st. And while this may seem like a pretty big number, um, it's nowhere near what other countries have been doing. Um, and actually since October 1st through to Fe uh, February 28th of 2017, we've only seen 5,539 uh, refugees come into the country, which is um, displayed by the Department of State. So as you can see here, um, we have Turkey with about just under 3 million refugees entering their country. We have Lebanon with just um, under a million. We have Jordan with about 660,000. Uh, Germany with 360,000. Canada with 36,000. And America at a mere 15,000. And these were all the refugees taken in from 2011 up until 2016. Um, and these statistics came from the Syrian refugees hosted by a country uh, that was published by Atlas. So, <clears throat> so when we're talking about um, Obama, we saw that we had a huge inflow and a, a large encouragement of these people coming into the country. Um, however, Trump's uh, new executive order has really set, our, set ourselves back. Now, originally Trump's ban had planned to um, ban the immigration of people from seven different countries, including Iran, Iraq, Somalia, um, and, and Syria. 
uh, as well as a couple others. Um, and it also banned Syrian refugees entering the country indefinitely. However, as you can imagine, this came with a lot of opposing views from Supreme Courts, as well as from um, groups of protesters in the, in the United States. So as the ban stands today, there is still um, an 120 day ban on all refugees from six countries. Iraq has been removed from that list. Um, as well as this, uh, Syrian refugees are no longer banned indefinitely, but they still fall under the 120 day ban. Um, and also it cuts the refugee program in half. So Obama's original refugee program had intended to have a seating of 110,000 people per fiscal year. Of Syrian refugees for, for fiscal year. Um, however, Trump's recent uh, order has put that down to 50,000. So as you can see, we took one step forward in the right direction and a huge step back. Um, and then this information comes from who would be barred by Trump's latest immigration ban, which was posted in the New York Times. Um, so I think it's important to realize that whilst this ban may have caused some physical barriers, the emotional barriers that it caused are far more significant. Not only are these uh, refugees and Muslims within this country feeling very unwelcome, considering that the ban on the countries were all Muslim majority countries. So this makes those that are either already applied to enter the United States or those already living in the United States have this very negative impact, feeling unwelcome, hostile, and this is the last thing we want to be doing when these people are escaping from war-struck countries, traveling several thousand miles just to get here for some asylum. Um, and I think this whole issue kind of stems from our wider issue in the United States of Islamophobia. Um, a recent YouGov survey showed that 55% of Americans view Islam unfavorably. As well as this, um, we see from a Huffington Post survey that um, 16 that Democrats that are younger Democrats um, view Islam more favorably by 16 percentage points than Republicans, and they're also 13 percent more likely to be willing to learn about Islam. So this is why now is a time, especially when we really need to be focusing on pushing our government, because we're now in a current situation where every part of our uh, government is um, in control of by the Republican Party. So we really need to make it a conscientious effort to educate our children on what's actually happening in Syria as well as other wars in the Middle East and to also um, teach them about what Islam really is. Because I think there's a very huge conception that all, like, all terrorists are Muslim and that's just fundamentally incorrect. The word Islam itself comes from the word Salam, which actually means peace. So it's very far from terroristic. So what can we do? We need to welcome in these people to our country, and we can create a harmonious America full of free people that are willing to welcome each other and not discriminate based on race and religion. It's time that we take a step forward into our diverse future and start identifying our similarities rather than our differences. In a time like this where we see a country who are fighting for their freedoms, as Americans who love our civil liberties and we take pride in our freedoms, we should see this opportunity as um, a time where we can aid them in achieving their goal. And as humans that have empathy, we should also be seeing this desperation and this um, need for help as an opportunity to, to do so. Um, so I think it's really important that we consider this. Let this not be a situation that prints in history books 30 years from now with end of chapter questions saying, why didn't America do more to help? Can we finally realize that stepping back isn't an option for us? And can we actually get involved in a war, not for the benefit of our own economy, but for the benefit of humanity? And so there's three main ways that we can help. First, we can donate. You can do this at UNICEF. This is a really good place to donate. It particularly helps the children. You can also sign several petitions. Just one of them that I've signed myself is at moveon.org. Um, but honestly, if you Google like petitions, there's plenty that go to the government. As well as this, you can volunteer at refugee camps if you're gonna break that. So uh, there's one thing I'd just like to end with, and this is to paraphrase Emma Watson's UN speech. If not now, when? And if not you and I, then who? Thank you. <laughs>